Hello, Agri History here. Today we will talk about the domestication of rye and oats. First, you'll talk about rye. Now, rye has limited information compared to other crops domesticated in the Neolithic era, such as peas, wheat, and barley. The main cause for this lack of information is that rye had never been found in any pre-classical site in either the Near East or Southeastern Europe, unlike wheat, peas, and barley. However, in the 70s, researchers found rye remnants in excavations of the Neolithic site called Can Hassan III, and these samples were dated back to 6600 BC, and the research community had a field day. The examination of these different specimens yielded some interesting results. All the rye in that area had already been domesticated. And so today we'll talk about the various models for rye domestication prior to this discovery and afterwards. Prior to the discovery, the Russian geneticist and agricultural botanist N. I. Vavilov discovered two centers of diversity for rye in 1928. The primary center has a range of East Antonia, Transcaucasia, and Northwest Iran. The secondary center of diversity ranges from Northern Afghanistan to Northeast Iran to Tajikistan to Uzbekistan and Turkmenia. Dr. Vavilov also suggested that rye did not come from the wild directly and instead was introduced as a secondary crop. This view is still supported by the available evidence. The way this model works is that Wheat is grown in certain areas that share the same environment as wild rye. Wild rye would become a weed within the wheat crop, and when the crop is harvested, the rye seeds would also be harvested and become a contaminant within the wheat seed. And as a result, wherever these wheat seeds were planted, rye came along with it. And as these wheat plants are traded and spread, wild rye would spread to that area as well. In areas with cold, wet soil and acidic soil, wheat does poorly, but rye thrives. And since they would have found rye palatable, the farmers would have cultivated and domesticated the wild rye to make domesticated rye. Evidence of climatic degradation in the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age widens the number of locations where rye could have been cultivated and domesticated. At that time, the best explanation of how rye entered Europe was from the Antolia via Balkan Peninsula trade routes. It is from these trade routes that pulse crops, barley, and wheat were also transferred. Researcher known as Engelbrecht proposed a different hypothesis in 1917. He proposed that rye came into Europe via Crimea, using the Black Sea as a trade route, and it was Greek traders that brought it over. Based on morphological evidence found in primordial rye remnants, the primordial form of rye probably entered Europe through both trade routes. So based on this evidence, it is likely that the conditions that led to rye domestication were common in that time period, and that rye domestication 
in this situation was simply inevitable. Like good architecture and bad pop music, in the right situation, some things are bound to happen. Using the archaeological evidence found in various European sites, Dr. Yanovich suggested that the cultivated rise of the Ukraine and Moldova, and perhaps elsewhere, came directly from the Caucasus as weeds of wheat. And this happened long after wheat, barley, and pulse crops had become established in these parts of southeastern Europe. But further evidence is needed to confirm this model. Utilizing genetic data, the likely ancestor of our common rye is a population of a wild grass called Sequel montanum with some genes from other species like Sequel anatolicum and Sequel valvalvi made through random hybridizations. Utilizing the evidence from the Kan Hassan free site, we can conclude that domestic forms of rye had already emerged in that area well before the end of the achromatic neolithic era it is not clear however whether or not the domesticated rye was still a weed or a fully domesticated crop this allows for the possibility that rye entered europe not as a weed of our crops but as a separate crop The natural history of oats is quite confusing due to the wide array of genetic and morphological groups. The genus was first divided into 29 species. Based on the interfertility of many of these species, the genus was compressed into 7 species. The genus of oats, Nozavina, is also divided into 3 groups based on ploidy. These are Diploids, tetraploids, and hexaploids. Cultivated hexaploid oat, Avena sativa, seems to be a combination of multiple species of unknown origin. However, the immediate progenitor of the species is known. This is because wild forms of Avena sativa are found all over Western Asia and the Mediterranean region. These wild forms are referred to as Avena sterilis or Avena fatula, depending on whether or not the spikelet bends at the base of the floret. These strains are interfertile to cultivated form of oats, as well as having the same genome. This has led to the conclusion that these two species are part of the same species known as Avena sativa, or the common oat. The only morphological difference between Avena bistiania is the position at which the Raquela remains attached to the upper floret, and the Vena nuda is simply a free freshing variant of the latter species. This has led to taxonomists reincorporating all of these species into Avena sativa. Our common oats are native to the ancient Near East, but were not likely used as a primary crop over there. Based on current evidence, it is likely that this crop was fully cultivated 3,000 years ago in Central Europe, not in the Near East. Oats were probably moved around as a weed seed contamination or as a secondary crop in a group of cultivated plants. This species was not fully cultivated until they reached the oat-friendly climates of Central Europe. In fact, oats reached North America and Argentina and Australia decades before they were grown as an individual crop in the Middle East. That covers everything for oats and rye. Stay tuned for the episode on corn. See you on the flip side.